The UK has lived without large carnivores for many years now, so we've just become accustomed to an environment without them. So we tend to perceive wild animals or animals that are big or predatory as something to be feared. So we have this kind of broken relationship with wildlife in a way, or wildlife that we don't know or understand. Like many other countries that have persecuted the wolf, the UK ingested all these folklores and these myths and stories and even invented a lot of them as well. This brought the image of the wolf as an evil being. Hi everyone, welcome to Animal Educate. My name's Abby. Please do subscribe to my channel if you haven't already. Today we're going to be looking at the history of the wolf in the UK. Wolves have inhabited the world from the Arctic to the tropics. They're a very successful predator. And as such, they're able to thrive in lots of different environments. They're very opportunistic animals. So due to this, after the ice age, they were able to cross lands and evolve easily. The UK was no exception and the skeletal remains that can confirm this. Early Roman and Saxon chronicles also suggest that wolves were very widespread across the UK and they're indigenous to England and Ireland. As lupines are so adaptable, they can prosper in any environment. So as herbivores started to evolve, the wolf just followed them across lands. The lineage of the lupines continued to thrive Remember, the wolf can thrive in almost any environment. There's exceptions, but it's fine for the majority. So it was fine across England's terrain and made the most of the forests and woodlands. So the grey wolf continued its movements and became the most widespread mammal until it became exterminated in various areas, including the UK. At the end of the Wisconsin period, two species were thriving the Homo sapiens and Canis lupus, humans and the wolf. There's evidence to suggest that early man and wolf formed symbiotic relationships. This is really fascinating when you think about it and what kind of relationship that was, a mutual relationship, a beneficial relationship on both sides. The wolf has always been a very clever and very successful hunter, whereas humans they never have been. They had to evolve into that role. They had to learn how to be a hunter. They had to use tools and weapons. They didn't have the agility, the strength, the claws, the sharp teeth, but the wolf did. So the wolf was viewed as a teacher instead of an animal to consume. There's many places around the world that suggest that the wolf and man had this thoughtful relationship. There's many different forms as well, carved, painted, word of mouth, written. So they're all evidence of this ancient, thoughtful relationship and this deep respect that we had for the wolf as a teacher. What happened to make us hate the wolf? Changes in this relationship between humans and wolf can be identified when man decided or started to settle and started to gather animals as his own, preferring this over a nomadic existence. So this conflict began 10,000 years ago with the domestication of goats, sheep, cows, or any animals that humans could make their own. Animals that are bred for food take up a lot of space. So humans started to take over the land, the wolf's habitat. Then you have the other conflict where if the wolf has been deprived of its habitat, it's also been deprived of its prey, its natural prey. So predation on livestock was always going to be an issue, but only when there was a shortage of wild prey, such as elk. When the forests are cut down and overhunting takes place, the wolf is just going to do what any other species would do. It's all about survival. So with this domestication of animals, the wolf was persecuted mercilessly. This was mainly driven by myths and folklore, which was portraying the wolf as evil and a pest. Religion, particularly Christianity, has tarnished a wolf's reputation. The Old Testament speaks of a utopian future, where 
The wolf and the lamb shall graze together, and the lion will eat straw like the ox. No harm will be done, no destruction. So before all of these relations could take place, people were to fear the wolf. People perceived the wolf as a trickster, cold-blooded, evil, conniving. The wolf was given all these human qualities. They weren't perceived as a wild animal anymore and became a metaphor for evil. In 950 AD, King Edred, regarded as the first king of England, is said to have imposed an annual tribute of 300 wolfskins a year. Later, when the Norman conquest of England followed, criminals would be ordered to provide a certain number of wolf tongues annually. Wolf fur also continued to be of great value, so hunting wolves presented multiple benefits. The Anglo-Saxon Chronicle states that the month of January was known as Wolf Monarch, as this was the first full month of the wolf hunting by the nobility. Officially, the hunting season would end on the 25th of March. This encompassed the cubbing season when the wolves were at their most vulnerable and their fur was of greater quality. The Norman kings continued to employ wolf hunters and no penalties or restrictions were lawed. The reign of King John presented no salvage for the wolf and the hunt continued to thrive. And then finally, King Edward I between 1272 and 1307 ordered the complete extermination of all wolves. Records decreased and wolves in Wales appear to have vanished during the early medieval period. Whereas in Scotland, due to its wider and sparsely populated lands, they survived until the 17th century. Before they were completely exterminated, wolves actually found refuge in the great highland forests that existed at the time, and their population increased. There's various stories regarding the killing of the last wolf, even that various woodlands were burnt down to deny the cover for them. The last wolves of the British Isles resided in Ireland, and after the Irish Council offered high rewards for killing the wolves, the hunters worked tirelessly to rid the remainder of the species. So by about 1760, we succeeded and we completely exterminated the wolf. It's been debated for many, many years on whether or not to return the wolf back to the UK. The problem is we still have all of these issues, all of these problems. Humans have encroached on the land. Our urban sprawl is widespread and it leaves little room for wildlife, which is part of the reason why we're so biophobic in the UK, because we don't really have wild spaces. We don't really understand what real wild spaces are and what real wildlife is. The wolf needs space, lots of space to roam. We took that space from them and we've continued to take the land. So if you put them back into the land now, all of the issues are still exactly the same. There are areas where wolves could perhaps, they could coexist with us, but because there's so many people that are against this happening, it just wouldn't work now. So yes, it's probably possible, especially in a very controlled experiment, but because there's so many people that don't want this to happen, the wolf would continue to be persecuted. It's not an ecological problem, it's a political one. That being said, attitudes amongst the public are changing but it's the attitudes of those that are directly affected that need to change. Engagement needs to be present with all parties. So it has to be something that we unite and decide together. So everyone needs to be involved. The public, landowners, farmers, rural residents, they'd all have to partake in the programme and they'd all need to look after the wolves as well as receive care themselves. There's many people and organizations out there now that can help. Coexistence is possible. The whole of the United Kingdom should bear the responsibility if the wolf returned and education is absolutely key. We need to understand the importance of the wolf, ecologically speaking, but also as a catalyst for change. We need the wolf, but it doesn't need us. We need nature, but it doesn't need us. Until the UK increases its tolerance and accepts this, 
and is willing to let the wolf take a little, returning the wolf would be a pointless endeavor and at the expense of the wolf. Well, that's it from me today, guys. I hope you've enjoyed the episode on the history of the wolf in the UK. Certainly an interesting topic. As usual, please do subscribe, like the video if you've enjoyed it and comment below with any questions. I certainly don't think I've included everything about the history of the wolf in the UK. So please do help me out if you've got anything else to add. Until next time, 